I need some traction. So our final session for the you morning before traction. lunch is Holly Liu, co-founder of Kabam, and she's going to share her growth journey from idea to $800 million exit. And she's going to be interviewed with the guy by, by Indy, who's the guy with my favorite haircut. It also helps that he writes the biggest checks in SF. Give it up for Indy and Holly. Ooh, these chairs are nice. Nice and comfy. Awesome. Uh, oh, sounds like the mics are on. Yeah. Holly, I'm really excited to chat with you today. Kabam's been such an amazing journey, and you've seen it all the way from co-founder to running product to just a variety of roles. So I think the audience is going to learn a lot from, uh, from this conversation. But maybe a, a good place to kick things off would just be take us back to its 2006, day zero in the Kabam story, oh, and, uh, you know, for those of you in the audience, this might sound crazy, but the iPhone didn't exist yet. Facebook was a really tiny company, uh, and people thought it was crazy, you know, insane that Microsoft wanted to uh, value them at whatever it was, nine hundred million dollars, and you know, that felt outlandish to a lot of observers. So that's the that was the backdrop for Kabam. Take us away. Yeah. So um, we started in two thousand six. Uh, over 10 years ago. And back then, we were not Kabam. We were called Water Cooler, and we were not building games. We actually uh, fundraised some seed funding uh, through Canaan Partners. And at that time, there wasn't even YC. So the funding environment looked incredibly different. And I can certainly talk about that. But we went up and down Sand Hill Road. Um, we ended up raising money from Canaan Partners. It's a Series A fund, but they also do early stage. And they even incubated us in the back office closest to the server room. I think it was just farthest, as far as away as they could put us. Um, the four of us, uh, to be inspiring to all of you, were actually quite incompetent. None of us had managed anybody before. Um, we all came in with different skill sets, and we all had met each other over various points of our lives. And we were very inspired by the Facebooks, um, by um, YouTube. They had sold for over a billion dollars. And so we said, you know what? Maybe we could build a corporate social network, kind of like Facebook, for, but for people who were working. Obviously, that didn't pan out. Uh, it took us really quickly uh, to find out that it didn't pan out. Uh, we tried to do a ton of, I guess they call growth hacking, which is basically spamming your friends and family, saying, like, please, please, please use us. <laughs> and um, it, it just wasn't getting the traction that we were looking for. Um, so we had a decision whether or not to return the money or kind of keep going. And at that time, Facebook opened up their API developer platform. And I think um, this is where we started looking at that. We said, you know what? It's not working here. Maybe we should go and um, move to where the users are, because obviously the users are not moving to us. And I think that that was a really fundamental kind of decision in our company, because that really set, us, set a culture for us to be very market driven. So you'll probably, if you ever look up the story of Kabam, you'll, you'll hear the P word, which is pivots. Um, in terms of how we've moved from a corporate social networking into fan communities and into gaming. And each time it was a very kind of market-led decision among with other things that we looked at, which was basically our core competencies as well as some of our passion points. Um, so that really was a very, very different time. The phone hadn't even been there. In fact, we didn't even go onto the phone until about 2012 is when we released our Excellent. first not our first game, but our first mobile game. And now we're solely 100% a mobile game. Uh, we, we just exited our company. And actually, mainly our Vancouver studio here is the one that we sold to Netmarble. And they're the ones that are responsible for uh, the game Marvel Contest of Champions. How many of you have heard of that one? You guys play those fighting games? Oh, a couple really of Really, we're at a tech conference, a and the four hands go up about an awesome game. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> Over 20 million downloads. Um, and it's, it's, it's been on the top grossing for, for many, many years. Um, but that, that's been built right here out of Vancouver. Awesome. So that's in a nutshell. Great, yeah. So, so Holly, maybe let's talk about, I, I'm guessing there's a few founders in the audience that that's also right. have this question of, all right, I got 18 months of runway. Product one isn't quite working. Maybe I should try product two. Uh, you're all sort of contemplating the P word, as she put it. How did you guys make that call? Uh, and yeah. in particular, it's easy to figure out if something isn't working. The thing you um, do next 
What, what signal did you look for? What, what was some of the instrumentation you had sure. to help you? Um, a lot of finger in the air. No, um, so the things that we looked at, I, I think you're right. Um, I think there were things that, you know, something's just not working with your business. Um, this was very true of, um, and, and you know when you have traction too as well. So when we moved off of, it took us about five, six months to get 1,400 users on our B2, like it was a corporate social networking site. So we knew that it was just, the growth was way too slow. There wasn't traction. And then when we moved on to Facebook, in terms of um, kind of the fan communities there, that we were getting, we got like a million users within a weekend. And we said, oh my God, we've never seen anything like it. In fact, the whole Silicon Valley had never seen anything like it. And um, I think how we decided what we would do there, we said, you know what, we could stay in the workspace, uh, but there was a couple of things that we learned on the product level that we said, you know what, let's not be holding ourselves to work. If we learn that, A, you know what, people afterwards weren't searching for work, we weren't hitting people's passion points, then we couldn't get some of the free marketing from SEO, because people weren't naturally searching for us. Um, the other thing is we weren't providing values of connecting to people. Mm -hmm. um, we were just kind of a social network within a company, so it became this weird, are you a gossip site or are you a tool from the management? So it was very strange. And so when we decided to go into TV shows and sports teams, we looked at, you know what, the markets were doing so much better for, um, for a Facebook, right? That's where all the users were. So we knew we were gonna go on the Facebook. But at the same time, um, we were thinking about what can we provide value? Um, Amazon did a great job with, the, with a book review, or like the book reviewers and the book readers to the book writers, as well as there was a company called Flixster at the time that was connecting movies to movie fans, almost like MySpace. I don't even know if you remember that, but MySpace for movies. Um, and one of the things we would absolutely go home every Monday night was to watch that TV show 24. I know that was like totally back in the day, but we were completely passionate about a couple of shows within the office. And so um, that really kind of led our direction, which was um, it had the market opportunity. We also had some of the core competencies of going into consumer. Actually, this is probably one of the reasons why we couldn't get enough traction because it became the, in the corporate social network because it was almost like a B2B and all of us had consumer background. So um, there's just a lot of different sets and we can definitely go into detail. You're smiling because you're B2B. <laughs> but well, it's I'm a also smiling system. because you heard it here first, folks. If you're stuck on a product decision, go watch TV. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But we knew we were all naturally searching for these things and we said, you know what, other people are doing it too. So we started out with doing a quote app. Um, the day we knew we had a ton of traction was not only when we got a million users, but we turned on our trivia game and it just melted our servers. So that's definitely a consumer thing. You have a server melting moment, it's def and it's not because someone pushed buggy code, it's because so many people are using it, and that's a good problem to have. Was there a Guilfoyle on your team who <laughs> rigged up the server yeah, room and right. put out a fire? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. His name was Mike, though. Nice. <laughs> Guilfoyle. Nice. Um, but yeah, so we, we ended up looking at those three things. And those, those were a lot of things we looked at when um, it was obvious within the fan communities. We grew that to one of the largest fan communities on Facebook for TV shows and sports teams. It was over you know, 60 million registered users, over 600 apps. And when ABC, the network, video, like they wanted to distribute video on Facebook, they didn't call up Facebook. Because at the time, there really wasn't a mechanism to do it. They called us up. They said, hey, you have the wow. audience. This is who we want. This is also before fan pages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then fan pages was introduced, and then at the same time, um, it was 2008, and it was just a huge mortgage crisis. So for anybody that's fundraising out there, the one thing we found is um, it's incredibly, like the bit largest impact to how easy, and it's still not easy, you'll get a lot of no's to raise money, is how well like the markets are doing. And when I say markets, it's almost like, um, it's almost like surfing, like in general, like how, how, are there any waves out there? And then are there waves at the beach you wanna surf at? So in your industry, how is it doing? So um, it was just the tech startups weren't there. A lot of things crashed and burned. We were ad supported. Um, so it was really, really hard to subsist. Um, and so that was a really tough year. Fast forward to 2010 when we, uh, we I think we raised our Series C within a week. It was that fast. Um, Series B took a whole year and a half, and I would say any startup you talk to try to raise money during that time, I think they all knew it was the apocalypse at that time for startups. And um, it wasn't because your product was horrible, it's just sure. there was just that atmosphere and that feeling of like, 
hey, your industry is not doing well, the tech industry is not doing well. And then finally, once your industry is going well, can you catch that wave? You know, can you go out there and get on the surfboard and actually surf? So there is a, a ton of operational capabilities that you need to have to be able to, to do that. Um, but yeah, that's very much pretty much how we looked a lot at our business as well as kind of how we moved into games as well because at that time, uh, the recession just hit and dried up all the ad dollars. I mean, we, we, were, we had saw a $3 million ad contract just evaporate. They're like, sorry, wow. we cannot do that. Um, so it was very clear it wasn't going very well. Um, so we looked around and said, what is doing very well? Um, and there was this little company called Zynga who had a very different business model. And we're like, well, games are incredibly recession-proof. In fact, when we were so, um, a fundraising story was the day, we, we had closed a Series B. We had term sheets and everything. On the day this VC was supposed to wire the money, it was the day Lehman Brothers had crashed. Wow. Um, so n nothing happened, it was just crickets. And I remember we were so upset and so pissed that we just, we're playing Halo, right? And so it's like, it was definitely very true that it's like games just provided us a way to kind of escape, to recuperate, to let off some steam. And we're like, oh, well, games are doing very well. On top of that, what was our core competencies? Well, you know, we had over 100 years of Facebook app building experience um, within our team. So that's when we started, that's what kind of led our product sure. direction at a high level of like, which direction should we go into? And um, honestly, from at the time I was doing a lot of design, for me it was made so much more sense to be able to build a long-term relationship from the customer versus when you're an ad-supported business, it's a little bit different. It's definitely different problems, but I have three stakeholders that I need to maintain, which is you know, the advertising dollars, the business, as well as my users, and sometimes those can be at odds. But now it was very clear, I'm like, I'm here to provide value to the customer and to the user, so. So great segue, I think you guys had a design construct called Design for Dollars. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I definitely, I like the alliteration, but in reality, it's a lot of like thinking about design for business impact. But see, that doesn't sound as cool as Design for Dollars. Uh, so my background is UX design. I was a product designer at AOL, and that's a really large company. And oftentimes things would get stuck in beta, so, um, and this also happens in console game development. You spend a lot of time making these arguments about what is better, what is not, then you open it up to maybe like a small user sampling, and then there's a lot of arguments about that. And it becomes religious wars around, you know, what, like, what is better for the user. It's very kind of what is fun. Um, so it becomes very ephemeral in many ways. And the nicest thing, this is why I think a lot of startups talk about, um, you know, iterating, I see Launch Academy has these things that say get shit done. <laughs> um, but iterating and keep on releasing really fast is because that's how you learn. Sure. And that's how you can verify your hypothesis. So oftentimes, um, one of the things that was never the best guiding light for me when I was at a larger company designing was we'd have a big document called PRD, which is the product requirements document. And I was basically designing features and I was designing things of like, hey, this is better, but it was unclear if it performed better. Um, but within our company, our product manager was really amazing in that we ended up bucketing a lot of our design requirements into basically four buckets. And if you're a business, these are probably things you always think about, which is acquisition, uh, engagement, retention, and monetization. And each one of them, we would always talk about features within that concept of like, how are we moving the business forward? What does that look like? It's much easier to do it for a web app, I will say that. Games, I don't know if you can actually do it this way because the design is a bit different. But for sure, on kind of web apps, I think it's definitely something that you could think about. Um, because at the bottom line, you want to impact the business. You want to tie that line of like, what is it that you're doing, and how do I see that impact? Um, so that's really kind of the whole idea of like when you're designing to think about what are these four things. It, it does come a little bit in game design because now for us, we're not a console game development, we're what we call free to play. So the games are free, but now I can see every single action and really I can probably, I can basically co-create the game with the players. It's a lot like building TV versus movies, TV shows versus movies. Um, and so you can actually see it. So now when we talk about fun within our company, um, we've talked about um, 
the, like fun is, is now something you can see because we say, well, if it wasn't fun, that means people don't come back. So we look a lot at retention rates versus before um, you could have a religious war around it and ne nothing ever sure. happens. Um, you know, I think one of the really cool things about building a culture and a conversation around that is done well, it can trickle all the way up to marketing and where you deploy user acquisition. And obviously, as you're thinking about your next wave of game development or product development, you can inform where you put the next engineering resource. That's right. Uh, talk a little bit about how you guys manage that and how it impacted the broader organization. Yeah, so um, some of the things that we do is sometimes, especially like our customer service, um, reps will definitely help in terms of building things forward. Um, we've definitely thought about things like uh, VIP loyalty programs um, that really kind of help focus our VIPs in terms of giving exactly what they want. But one of the things that we really look for um, that's really impacted, and this is as of late, which is um, very much we look at regulars. And these are people who come back every day, seven days a week. Um, and those have been seen to impact the game and the ecosystem much more to make it a healthier monetization environment for everybody as well. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, I know we're going to run out of time in four minutes. <laughs> so I think one of the questions that doesn't get talked about enough sure. is how you build a team for scale. Um, you know, in some ways, products are measurable. Marketing performance is measurable. People yeah. are hard to measure. Uh, and what I love about your story is you've been a co-founder at some point in the Kabam journey. You actually ran all the people operations. Yeah. Talk to the founders in the room on sort of the biggest do's and don'ts when they add their first senior hire to the team who is not a co-founder in whatever capacity. So, yeah. I will say in general, um, I think our biggest mistake was growing too fast. In 2011, we started out with 150 people. By the end, we're 450 people. Very unclear how much um, that um, brought net-net. Um, but I definitely think if we were to do it again, we would definitely do it a lot slower. Um, and this is where you could focus a lot on um, that first senior hire outside of like your first executive or first grown-up that you're going to bring on to the table. So um, in terms of things that you should look for is obviously looking for somebody that's complementary uh, to the executive team. But this person, usually at that, that space, they can't, be so, they can't be an organization that's 10x your size. Because what you worry about, and this is, we've had this happen before, is that you overhire. The, the org isn't where they want. And they don't know exactly, how, we, we've had this happen before. They don't know how to operate without the infrastructure already set up. Um, so these people are very special. I mean, co-founders are zero to one, one people, and hopefully um, they're you know one to ten, ten to twenty, and that's kind of um, the founders for us as well. We were able to kind of grow and scale with that. We've made a ton of mistakes along the way, um, but one of the things you do have to look for is they need to be like. I usually have a nice rule of thumb of like, hey, if they manage something three x larger, then they they can definitely do things um, that can get their hands dirty because that was something that's still important. Especially sure. your first executive, you're probably not going to be that big. Um, and then um, if you're just on the cusp of your growth phase. So um, growing is really like when you're hiring your PJMs, when you're pulling in like 20 people uh, a week, that's like crazy growth. Um, but when you're really looking for, for growth, you definitely are looking for people who are OK setting up that infrastructure. It won't be perfect, but they'll set it up. You do have to be really careful about people who are looking for a flip in terms of monetary flip, um, and they just want to get onto the rocket ship. I think sometimes you do have to be careful in, like, in not attracting those bad actors. And um, we definitely um, suffered a lot, even culturally, from some of those things. Um, but definitely, I think um, scaling people is probably one of the most difficult things. Um, and when we talk about scaling people, it's basically the question of, can they have this better or more results, but with the same, like being the same? So it's just like writing code. If you write one piece of code and it hits billions of people, we well, add another billion, it doesn't matter. Sure. Right? Um, and that's kind of like when we dump more people, can this executive still lead? Can they still delegate? And the you, you yourself 
um, well, speaking from a founder perspective, you find your job changes like constantly, and you're constantly failing. That's true. You're constantly being incompetent. So if you're okay with ambiguity and incompetence, perfect job for you. Um, but if you're not, then it's really, really difficult because people, uh, especially in the growth phase, they'll sometimes they'll, again you attract bad actors sometimes, and sometimes it can get to um, a worse phase. But um, when you do do kind of the growth phase, some of the things you do need to look for is people who can scale, which you look for people who can communicate well. You look for people who have empathy slash self-awareness. Um, you look also for people who are okay with ambiguity, particularly in the growth phase. And then I'll put a plug on in terms of for companies, you as an organization, like what are some of the things you can do to even help people scale? Because some of the things, I really loved was trying to grow people internally because they they learn a lot about what the Kabam way is. Uh, if they perform very well, like let's reward them. Why not? Um, this is great. Um, but you know, set up some definitely get some HR people in, people that you can trust to help mold and shape um, the managers because it's usually people who need to learn how to manage, right? Um, build a great talent pipeline as well, right? Um, so these talent pipelines are incredibly important. And also um, communicate with them as often as possible. These people that you're like, hey, they got the potential to scale. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, thank you, Holly. This is great. And it looks like we're out of time, but please give it up for Holly. I need some traction. You need some traction. Let's get some traction.